operate uh, stations as far away as Portland, Oregon, which is roughly that direction. Uh, okay, so a another part of the hobby is to make your radios. Uh, the term homebrew is used by analogy to homebrew beer. That is to say, a license operator can simply make a radio for their own use, but can't sell it. But the moment you bring a radio to market, you end up with a bunch of technical deals. The method for testing radios historically has been to buy an expensive instrument which has a spectrum analog, essentially, with the usual antenna ports plus control ports and audio ports. However, A, they're expensive, and B, they're not necessarily optimized for what cameras care about. So, in principle, if you're doing a hungry radio, you get some parts, you sell them together, you operate them, everything is awesome. Uh, <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> You know I'm lying. Um, so there are a number of problems that are uh, even worse for radio. The first is that some regulators are getting nervous about this and increasingly so. Uh, IMJ in particular in Singapore at the moment is unable to say yes to this. Uh, <laughs> they haven't quite said no. Yes. But uh, they got that yes. Yeah, four months ago they haven't got an answer. That's that's quite yeah. So um, the next and the really big issue and, and the legitimate issue that concerns Sorry. Uh, the concerns aren't there is interference. It's really easy to create interference, and it's particularly hard to detect. A major area is harmonics. Spurious tones that are like, multiple of the, of the carrier. Uh, an example from a ham test in Daytona when someone brought a, a bunch of lab gear and did free testing. For any radio anyone wanted to test it with, a guy turns up with his proudly modified uh, HD walkie talkie to increase the, the carrier power. And so they hooked it up and then and, and measured it. And not only had he reduced the carrier power, he created a third harmonic that was larger. <laughs> now, this was a two meter VHF, so the, 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 the 70 centimeter uh, harmonic was in an amber band, but it was an amber secondary band where listening to four talk rules apply. And of course, if you don't know your friends anything on the band, you can't listen. So he was, in fact, breaking the rule unintentionally, albeit in a not serious way. So it's a, the, a very large part of the risk is that you're doing harm that you don't know you're doing. And so it's that problem that I'm looking to help simplify. It's not the whole issue, but that's certainly the biggest one. And from the same point of view of risk management, that's really the issue that I'm hoping to offer some comfort. Um, the next is a broader issue with making our radios, less so perhaps at HF, but that it becomes a line of nutrition throughout. There's a lot of things to test. Yes, nowadays you can get a $50 tiny SA and verify that your radio is not a big. Uh, stuff that it's not supposed to be, uh, or just own more expensive instruments that you can afford to. But actually, there's a bunch of other stuff that you either really care about. Is your outside of drifting? Are you uh, using as much modulation and deviation as you're allowed to because that makes your signal more visible? Are you operating inside of a bandwidth? Uh, is your phase noise visible? This matters for weak signal work, where the, the phase noise in the local oscillator can, in fact, overwhelm the signal that you're trying to detect. Um, how sensitive is your radio? Is the level of perceptual appropriate? This is good for. Um, receiving close to um, legitimate, very powerful signals, very close to weeks of the after. Again, this is sort of a piece of the puzzle. Uh, all this stuff is time consuming, uh, but okay, maybe we can all it. And it all requires costly equipment, at least in principle. It occurred to me a while ago, I uh, spent quite a lot of time running, watching a YouTube channel called The Signal Path, which does a lot of time going through the architecture of the test equipment. Almost all of them, uh, a low end PC, a little screen, not very powerful CPU, a crappy keyboard, a bunch of special buttons that you used to work your way through menus. What we might think of as an SDR, a DAC, an ABC, and an FPGA or an ASIC or 7 ASICs to, to process the data at its uh, highest sample rate. And then various sort of workbench items, attenuators, filters, oscillators. Um, maybe I can make one of these. <laughs> So the, the context is what I want is a box. I do not want to put yet another little screen and a bunch of buttons. That people have a mania for that. I hate it. It's revolting. I like using my laptop. I have a bigger screen at home. I'd rather just use a web interface, talk to them, an internet port, and, well, and you know, not, not provide any user interface on the front of the box at all. Just you know, a power switch, a power line, and a bunch of sockets. And then have your antenna, microphone, speaker, push it all about control lines to the device in the test. And so then you sort of talk to it 
using users in that world. Inside the box, the design is relatively simple. Um, something like a Raspberry Pi, uh, a USB sound card, a USB SDR. At the moment, we're looking at the line 7002, the line SDR. Another candidate, perhaps, is Tech Mondo Dinner, which has the uh, line 6000 chip in it. Sadly, not useful for HF. That, that has a lower frequency of 300 megahertz. Uh, how many people know what the Lino is? <laughs> Only a couple? Okay. So, Bunny um, is on the room and he's always uh, built a, a bit of a map of a few years ago, which included an SDR chip. But, okay, that's not slide. The, the rest of the design is fairly straightforward. Uh, Opto couplers to isolate the GPIO pins, things like pushing the, the transmit button, because you otherwise end up with parasitic currents making the way back into your uh, test device and into the laptop, and that uh, If you're lucky, it just causes things to go wrong and run up it. it destroys things, especially if you've got tens or hundreds of watts uh, coming out of your uh, So that, that begins an issue with that array, but doesn't arise in smaller IoT applications. Speaker and micro, simple isolation. Um, the one area that perhaps needs a little bit of explanation is the radio end itself. Uh, you need at least two different, at the same reason, two different pedals. One has to cope with whatever the output power is from the transmitter. So if you have a few watts, then okay, you have a small attenuator. If you have a radio that puts out a few hundred watts, you need an attenuator that's physically off quite large to get it down to something that you can then put with precision step attenuator and then into the input of the USDR. The other big issue is calibration. Um, this, this applies to all instrumentation, but certainly if you're sort of cobbling together cheap hobbyist bits and presuming to measure the performance of a radio in a way that might be pleasing to a regulator, calibration becomes a really important question. I'll come back to that. I've done quite a deep way here already. So, uh, certainly for any transmitter tests, and it's been most of my time so far as well, the big question is power. How do you measure power? So here's a beautifully simple way of doing it. This is uh, in radio. Here the companion, which is the little bit of radio. Uh, we take a source, we just pipe up. Power. 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 Uh, conversions. The samples this far are on MQ. You're sampling uh, at some frequency and then you have it sampling again at a quarter cycle delayed. So the same frequency but delayed one quarter of a cycle. And so what you have conceptually are two samples that run into each other. To, to, to compute the magnitude, you just multiply them and take the square root. Given uh, radio requires this uh, uh, complex domain squared, we switch together from blue being complex and orange. Uh, real. Um, what's important about it is that so far you're looking at voltage. Here, however, if you just multiply them together, you're now looking at something that varies with power. Power varies with voltage squared over bits. Now, so you've got a series of speed samples here that are linear and proportional voltage, which is great. You need to multiply it by a constant. What constant? That's the calibration problem. Getting from this all it's going to hour of why what's coming out here is not and can't be directly over the current radio, but over a short range, you can say that a 10% change in the radio's output power is a corresponding 10% change here. And so, as long as you've got to calibrate, you've got enough basis for saying, here's a number, dear regulator, that's probably within about 100% range. And for the purposes that we're trying to solve, that's enough. So, again, this is, this is like, how do we do this cheaply? Um, let's do a moving average. You have to do the averages on the linear measurements, you can't average anything else, then take a little bit of that to, to decimals. Okay, this is awesome. This gives us how much power is coming out of the antenna socket with a bunch of qualifiers. That's not enough. It's important information, but it's not enough. Uh, the reason is you need to know about how much of that power is present in the harmonic and how much, sorry, the metal, and how much is present in the harmonics. If your radio looks like this, don't ever think of an antenna. <laughs> this is approximately a square wave. One kilo, that's a particular example, but one kilo. But the uh, fundamental is about 3 dB below what's expected. Uh, the third harmonic is only 10 dB below it. 
uh, even in the simplest of uh, regulatory cases, this is the, the, the worst permissible performance here is that it's 43 dB or 20,000 fold below the carrier bound. So this is a thousand, if this were an actual radio, this is a thousand times the simplest possible compliance case. And actually, if you do under various circumstances, that compliance requirements get tighter. So you don't never work on it. But what I'm saying is, it's not enough to know how much power can have on the You do need straight away to analyze it by frequency. The harmonics are relatively easy because the filters are not terribly difficult. If, you're, if whatever your fundamental is, you can readily build a filter that goes 10% of your side. And then you can sort of move that up the first time on it, do that, and then the second time on it, do that, sorry, second time on it, third time on it. And so you can get your spectral weight down pretty cheaply in software without any complicated uh, maneuvering. That's a really important test, and it's a regulatory one, not a uh, usability one. And fortunately, that's relatively straightforward. Uh, another one is phase noise. And this is a particular interest of amateurs because of the habit of listening to stuff that's come to either the ionosphere and therefore is incredibly weak. So, start with a presumed near pure tone uh, at whatever the reference is, and then a nearby signal, 100 megahertz is 20 kilohertz, that is at 90 dB down, a big end. It's, it seems like a very small signal as far as I'm concerned. That's huge. You've got off the shelf radios to go 60 dB below that. However, if the oscillator in the radio is in the LL, which is the EVR, to keep the average frequency right on the line where it's supposed to be, the, um, the, the operation of the LL to continually step the control board up and down or the, uh, the counter ratios up and down causes noise that looks like this. That's referred to as space noise. And you can very quickly have more phase noise than the signal you're trying to receive. And so regulators, state numbers, they don't much care. But you certainly, as a builder, it's an interest to know that you've made a mistake that's drastically worsened the phase noise present in the design. So there's a whole lot of difficulties here. Uh, unfortunately, to make a confession, there is not showing devices that spend much too much time understanding this problem and don't yet have our own code. So this is where I'm going, not where I'm going. Um, I'll come back to that. Oh, no, sorry, here it is. Right, OK, so the, the issue with phase noise is you've got to measure close in. Uh, in a spectrum analyzer, you do this with a, an IF filter that's really narrow. Uh, it's typically done electronically or part electronically, part computationally. They're expensive. They're fiddly, they're electronic. Uh, you get fiddly, it's electronic. You do it computationally. You use fast Fourier transforms. You add a whole range of new sources of error, each one of which has to be corrected for, uh, which is uh, not only deadly, but computationally expensive. And my plans to run this on a Raspberry Pi Zero, uh, I suspect they're going to run into a problem. The interesting news is, of course, for the one that's the other PTI level, so not sure. It might be the case. Uh, the other big issue is the calibration. This I was concerned about until someone drew my attention to the other way of and uh, a stupidly clever way of solving the problem. Start with a reasonably clean oscillator on arbitrary frequency. These are available at the shelf for sets. The, all you need is it's a reasonably clean sine wave. So no PLL, just a crystal. Um, jam a pair of back to back diodes across it. This revolting procedure has two effects. One is you now have a substantial energy component to double the frequency. The other is peak is and it's not going anywhere, so the diodes don't tend to change their, their cover voltages at any time over a period of decades. So people take that the other components not change, the silicon diodes aren't going anywhere. There might be a thermal problem. I haven't looked carefully at the thermal characteristics of a 4 level 8, but there are other diodes that are pretty cheap and very stable, or pretty cheap and very stable. So what you then need to do is remove the second harmonic, which is what this thing is doing. This becomes conductive at a frequency, you basically choose this to be the second harmonic. Then what not? You've got back to your sine wave, uh, but it now has the, uh, the rather fixed power level. What, whether it's the internal power level is not important, what's important is it predictable. At that point, you walk into your friendly uh, tertiary institution of the lab and say, hi. <laughs> and I've had one here volunteer for this. Uh, could you please do a calibration line on this? Uh, that then becomes the basis for the subsequent results. Because this then solves a whole lot of uncertainties, or at least 
works around a whole lot of activities in my other way to clearly achieve them to answer the design. Um, the other thing I missed in my early, early design is the other obvious fact that I, I'm not currently a problem. So in fact, likely there are more switches at the Calvary than uh, the, the tennis office as well. Uh, this also comes up when you get Calvary by some time. So consider this a whole design and subject to some significant revision as a difference concrete. Um, so what's left? Write the code. Again, I apologize. Uh, the phase most thing does concern me is relevant to be able to receive uh, HF signals that have been propagated by the atmosphere. And this seems to be a you can spend as much money as you like. The uh, open radio relay league actually publishes its test procedures. They state a specific uh, oscillator from Windsor, like I approached the manufacturer and asked, it's a three thousand dollar item. However, you can do useful phase noise measurements by having in your test instrument an oscillator that's only slightly better than the oscillator that's in your radio. You take whatever's happening in the radio and you go you know, double price, and that is a reasonable oscillator that's in your the test instrument. You've got enough basis for discovery that you've made this. What you're looking for is a serious mistake, not an average. Okay. I'll just stand very, very still. <laughs> So, um, so the yeah, that, so this is a uh, it's going to be a trade off at any point, and I haven't yet gone ahead of hand. But what I have discovered is that not only is the oscillator going to be expensive, but the computational is difficult. I'm not going to go in now, but also electronics, so it will be done computational, and that gets into a whole set of if you're doing FFT, you've got to have buckets. And if the, the thing, if the tone you're measuring is split between two buckets, then the two measurements are coming through the down. Okay, the fix is severe. Uh, but easily said, hard to do. Uh, there's an issue with PCM noise for some of the measurements. I think it's okay, but I haven't yet convinced myself that it is or isn't. This, the, the analyzing in a, in a time discrete way, of course, doesn't perfectly reduce the source weight at all. And the risk is that the time slices introduce enough noise to be to exceed the at least the 3OI and possibly the IG performance of the device in the test. Not sure probably a problem, but I haven't yet convinced myself either way. Uh, the really big one is that this result this relies on a control channel. So if we go back to that little bell 4900 and the algorithm for TM, uh, its controls are a variable resistor for power and a variable capacitor for tuning, neither of which this device can control through a serial port. And so there is this gigantic qualifier that says that for this to be meaningful, the ready testing has to have at least a microcontroller with a serial port. And it's then using reactors or capacitor banks or whatever to do the, the control rather than uh, actual pops of the user terms. And for a lot of home, that's actually a problem. That we've sort of built in traditional designs that do now for things, that gets it complicated to add a microcontroller, particularly off the shelf here. Um, another issue is the, this is a similar issue with cinema actually, uh, synchronizing uh, the sound card and the SD. So in cinema, you look at the clapperboard, you synchronize the video of the sound, you have a clapperboard, which makes a sharp. Pulse and sound and a visible thing on the video, and that's enough to light it up. I don't have a good way yet to do the same thing with a cheap sound card and a cheap SDR. Working on it, but it kept the mind its unsolved problem. Uh, and finally, this one, uh, regulators all over the world are doing this. Singapore added it to the Amateur Radio Spec about two years, three years ago, and that's the EFC stuff. Uh, they're more concerned about emissions than about acceptance, of course, but they do want really to care about both. Uh, have very early parts of an approach to do that. They're looking for ideas for bench top EAC to be fined metal boxes, uh, sometimes called tent cells, sometimes called wheel chamber metal or micro oven. Uh, there's a few different ways of doing it. There's, there's a few different ways of doing it. Uh, that's far more ambitious, but that IMDA is already asking, and in the context of home, the, the, the spec they point at, the, the, 
you cannot have an EU spec or a US spec. The EU spec actually states expressly that it does not apply to license standards making regulators for their own use. We're actually named as the only use of that's named in the standard that says this is the lovely stuff because this stuff's not coming to market, therefore don't use it. And find they say use that standard for home group. So maybe, hopefully we just avoid that altogether because it's ridiculous. If you're making a million of a device, uh, a small problem with interference is a significant issue. If you're making one, not so much. Uh, anyway, that's where I am. Uh, questions, comments? How do you know that you're not breaking the law while you're testing? How, how do you know that you're not breaking the law while testing? Yeah, this is a, uh, <coughs> Even more difficult question. So, at least with respect to IMDA, what they're looking for is that the device itself that appears in the license, they formally authorize that you hook up to an antenna, uh, behave sensibly. Yes, it's a near certainty that there's an amount of emission occurring uh, during testing, like that. Tracking spectrum miles on the bench. Yes, <laughs> for sure, there's some amount of leakage, but on the test frequency, it will go into full fire unscripted. Um, that's not the concern. The concern is almost a democratic one that says we authorize to be used to connect this radio to an antenna and, and, and transmit power. We want to be convinced that the thing that we give you permission to do is reasonable. Uh, more generally, low power levels, uh, you don't in general put single digit watts, let alone tens or hundreds, uh, into a, a test environment until you're certain that the milliwatt and microwatt range that Everything is working correctly. And I mean, only then you can start talking about power apps and all that sort of thing. But yeah, I, so the whole thing is a compliance question. So, like, how do we avoid getting ourselves into a uh, yeah. sure. So, any others? Sorry, uh, didn't really get the bit about EMC. So, is there, it's an emissions requirement? Emissions and acceptance. Okay. So, the device, if you're looking for benchtop EMC, you, one of them is tensor we use for torture testing. You put a device in a tensile and then you put a kilowatt of power in it. And the device has to not malfunction. So, for example, if it contains a transmitter and a microcontroller, the microcontroller must not, as it was, no, no, dying is actually okay. What it must not do is select an impermissible frequency and begin transmitting just because of the presence of uh, some of the. So, this is. That's a bit consumer protection. It's a little yeah, yeah, yeah. hypothetical. For now, it's like my radio's not working off the clock. Why? Yeah. Uh, but this is I'm there taking a very consistent approach. So, yeah. uh, but it means that because the same thing asks us about uh, electrical safety. Well, that requires testing at sixteen thousand volts. A, I don't do that in my heart. Uh, and B, you test it as part of the, the tests. You test the instructor. If you're doing the lab, you send two 